One of the things I thoroughly enjoy doing is interacting with school members. One of the things that's quickly becoming obvious is it gives me a platform to bring on new faces with new stories. I'd like to introduce you to Brandon, whose story began at 48. Let's do something and call that midlife. A lot of us have conversations about starting in our 20s or 30s, but you know what? Is it too late to start at midlife? Brandon, how you doing, man? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, do me a favor, introduce, introduce yourself uh, to the YouTube world, to the school community. Who is Brandon? Tell us about your journey uh, up to 48 and then why real estate at 48? Yeah, I'm Brandon and I, I live here in Fort Worth, Texas area and began the journey and kind of what I wanted to share is from the past. I had read two key books that started the journey was The Millionaire Next Door and yep. then Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so I have a little different background. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, mm. but I had a, had an interest in accounting and finance. And so I uh, got into banking for several years mm. and I knew I wouldn't be there permanent, but I wanted to learn as much as I could. And they actually allowed me to meet with some of our biggest loan people in the bank. And these were, these were most of them, multiple millions, a few of them DECA millionaires. Mm. And I got to interview them. And I remember as I was interviewing them, it really, for me was a study. And I'm just so glad that the bank allowed me to do this because I was using it for my purpose in that I wanted to know how did they make their money. And, and what I found most of them, it was there was a lot in business, but there was a lot in real estate. And But what I did see is they not only, if they didn't make their money in real estate, they kept their money in real yeah. estate. Yeah, I'm starting to realize that more and more. Um, you know, the people who have large portfolios of real estate, it's it's becoming enough of a trend that folks are like Grant Cardone or Cody Sanchez. I mean, Cody Sanchez just did a whole video series on this. Go bust your ass in a small business. Take the take the cash that you have and go park it in real estate, right? Real estate is, I think she called it preservation. Um, yes. We're seeing a lot. I'm. It wasn't obvious to me for 20, I don't know, 15 years, right? Because all I knew was, yeah, go buy a rental house, one rental at a time. It wasn't obvious to me that a lot of small businesses even medium-sized businesses, their founders or CEOs are parking cash in real estate. So the, uh, that was pretty cool. I actually want to ask something that I hadn't planned on. You you indicated that you were raised, your family are, are entrepreneurs. I've been very clear that my family is, is employees, right? There's not an entrepreneur among them. I'm just curious, what was that like? Maybe as a teenager, once you really knew what was going on, was there ups and downs? Was it crazy schedules? What was it like? being raised by entrepreneurs? Because I have no idea. It, it was in my whole family. All my uncles, my dad, my grandfather started the business in 1969. But I actually now remember the uh, the crash in the mid 80s because mm -hmm. I saw kind of how tight we became as a family. They lost, they were in an ad agency business. So we lost a lot of accounts and, and times were tight during the mid eighties. And I, yeah. now I'm looking back, I remembered even more and understand those cash flow cycles yeah. as a, as an entrepreneur. I always say my first business was in junior high. I was selling bubble gum on the black market in school. <laughs> yeah. We, lots of us got that. I got candy bars, but yeah, it's funny. Yeah. That's funny. So it's it's really interesting because again, I'm assuming most people are like me. Those those formative years, that kind of twelve to eighteen, the ones you're going to remember. Um, yes. What I remember about the early '80s was they sucked. Right, eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, eighty four. Uh, they were horrible years. The worst of my childhood. I remember my father being unemployed for over a year. I think it was thirteen months or something. I remember I remember having to get a job uh, to help, you know, put food in the refrigerator. Yeah, um, I was mowing lawns and I'd found a, a hundred dollar bill when I was young and how important that was. And I, I they needed it, too. And yeah. Um, I, yeah, I agree. Those little memories. Um, 
of late seventies, early eighties, yeah. I do remember some pieces of it, you know, not yeah. fully, but some pieces of it. I do. The last thing I remember about the, I think it was, this was the late seventies was the gas lines. I remember asking my dad, why are, why are we in line? And it's like, it's our day. I'm like, what do you mean? It's our day. Well, you only can fill up your gas every other day. If your, your car's an odd or an even number, I'm like, this is weird. What, I know this is a be? political statement, but I remember meeting Reagan in Dallas and how de- how excited my dad was. That's yeah. That's all. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that is not political about that. He's a president, or was maybe he was running at the time. Um, nothing wrong with that. Reagan was a great president. 80, 80 yeah, whatever. He was a good president. Um, so let's talk more about. Okay, you get out of you get out of high school. I'm curious, given your family's entrepreneurial, did they did they make college optional? Did they make it required? What was what was what was college to your family? College, well, for me, I played tennis. So I I got recruited and played tennis for college. That's why I was going. But I wanted to go into business. My Actually, my family allowed me to open. I was one of the original food trucks in our town. I had a, had a little trailer and my grandfather taught me accounting with the old T ledger schedules. And it was very important. I still use it to today. Sometimes that's yeah. why I see my accounting. Yeah. But it was so good. I had to do payroll. I only had a f- couple of friend, teenager employees, but I had to do all the payroll manually with the schedules. Sure. And it really taught me a lot about the flow of money because I did did the accounting. It didn't make much money. It paid, you know, kind of a job in the summers is when it was open in college. So that was my other second business. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just taught me a lot. And then I knew even reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I probably was going to go into business for a period of time to grow that. Now, I've not been in big, I've never grown huge businesses, smaller businesses. I just recently sold one July 1st. Congratulations. Little sale. It wasn't huge. Um, I have another business right now, just property management. And this will probably be my last business. This will be it. And, and hopefully with, with the real estate, this will be the financial independence here. And I think it may be up to in the next five years. There you go. One of the things that's really interesting now that we kind of think about this entrepreneurship, the story of the 80s, losing accounts, cash flow getting tight. We can also correlate that to real estate, right? A lot of the this this is important because there's a lot of people in real estate that will flex their net worth. What they don't realize is that doesn't matter when you don't have enough cash to pay the bills. That right. net worth number A could be fictitious, could be exaggerated, but there's there's one number where if you could market and sell, and then there's another number that's a fire sell, and they are not the same. And I think I think more new investors would benefit from, frankly, going slower on acquisition. It, it really scares me when I hear people go, I acquired three in three months. I'm like, ugh. I'm there with you. I came from the banking world. So I always think, um, I do think safety, especially at this age too. I'm using, you know, but I'm also thinking, because I remember a few experiences from some clients. So I'm looking at my loan to value so that I have an exit plan. I I do think worst case scenario, I need a path out. If things get tight, I got to have a quick path out. And I've been cognizant of those over the last four years that my average, I track it. You know, yeah. what I always say what we focus on expands. And so I track that. And right now our loan to value is 60% on all our properties. I've got a path out. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you, you still can get liquid at a profitable number. You're not, you're not short selling or things of that nature. That's pretty good. So let's talk about the event, right? You start this journey midlife. Again, we're going to call 48 midlife. What what was it? What was the eye opening moment? What happened? You know, wh- why suddenly real estate? I was building businesses, and that was a focus, and and growing our uh, net worth and our our ability path to retirement, and and I was in real estate, so I said, <clears throat> I'm a I'm a hypocrite if I don't own a whole bunch of real estate when I'm selling it. I I don't know why that's what it, it came across. It's like yeah, if I'm not in it. I'm a hypocrite. Yeah. It's and really so, funny. Uh, I, I I wished more agents had that epiphany or eye-opening moment. It's I, I've actually met probably more agents that are renters 
than it's unreal. You're right. owners. It's crazy. And, and so I was like, okay, we're I'm getting closer. That 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 horizon's coming rapidly <laughs> to me. And, and and I'm like, okay, I've got to jump in this and get in into it quick. And and we had missed an opportunity a few years in the past. We were building a house. I had a phenomenal, I call them once every decade type of opportunity. And I, we couldn't do it. We were in the middle of a build of our own personal house. And I said, never again. Mm-hmm. I've got to be ready. Yeah. And and so the way I do it is the build rent, build to rent model. Mm-hmm. And happened to be driving to work one day. And this guy calls me out of the blue and says, Hey, I've got three lots I need to sell. And so we ended up working those out over a period of time. They were so good. I didn't tell my banker till I had it in contract. <laughs> So that's funny. Yeah. But but that's kind of those steps. And then I was like, okay, we've got to get them the lots being built on producing money. And I love building. I've grown up building. My parents built every one of our houses. I have built every one of ours. And I, oh, I wow. actually enjoy that process. Not everybody does. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I look at that process, that timeline, the moving parts, man. I break out in hives. I would much rather buy a finished product. Yeah, it's not for everybody. I like putting my personal yeah. fingerprints on it, but I just love the process. And so what I've seen over these last few years is I've been able to build them at basically 20% discount off of retail. Okay. So that's my business model is every one of them has been 20% equity or better each mm. time I've built them. And I get to do enjoy the process of designing, decorating, you know, creating all the finishes. I build them, and this is my safety thing. I, my wife and I, we build them as if, and I build nice. I want to be proud of my portfolio. Right. If I had to live in it, would I want to? So I do mm-hmm. a little bit nicer. Okay. I build them custom. I mean, that's really what it is, and it's not your typical, mm-hmm. very basic build finish out. And I found that it's attracted a, a renter where I'm getting 50 to $75 more than market because okay. of the nice finish out and which helps right. cash flow and all of it. It all comes together. So let me poke at that a little bit. So again, how many, how many builds are you are in progress in an average year? I'm trying to speed that up because the horizon is getting quicker. Um, and with getting the comp, the bank's getting comfortable with me too. So, right. So I've got four builds finished. Okay. I'm starting two single family houses in the next, man, I hope two weeks we're going to be clearing lots. Okay. I'm also looking ahead for dirt. I'm trying to stay about a year ahead because it's a challenge. Okay. I'm trying to find dirt at $15,000 or less. Now, is this dirt infill lots that you're trying to pick up or is it, you know, you're trying to get bigger swaths and then parcel them out or what are we trying to do with dirt so far they've all been individual lots okay they have the full utilities I, a new one and i posted this one school the other day a new strategy i went to a tax sale never been to ah, one yeah and i got one i had highlighted two two were the main two i knew the property i walked the property i knew the value of them and i got one of the two and got a nice Thirty-three percent haircut. I got it for this ten thousand dollars. Nice. Yeah, there's there's a lot of opportunity. The beauty of what I'm hearing so far, and and it may may sound to the average person that you're very different than me, and I don't see it that way. We we have both chosen our vehicle, and we focus on it. We don't get distracted. Yes. So your inputs are cheap lots. Your inputs are design, and you're trying to exit with at least twenty percent margin. Why is twenty percent margin important? Well, then you could burr out your capital. It's just, it's a genius move if you can do that. Yeah. And and I stay focused. What I've watched, unfortunately, I, since I manage a lot of properties too here in Dallas, Fort Worth, we've got investors who are looking a hundred different directions and yeah. they're not sticking with one or one really and focusing on it. And they get distracted by the shiny object of the next YouTube video they watch. And it's dis- disappointing because if, if, Everything's a priority. Nothing's a priority. Yeah. You know, so I've been trying to help people get started, understand getting to four, all of this stuff. And obviously one of the things I hope to be known for is this notion of a buy box. 
for the longest time, I thought the buy box was powerful because it allowed me to focus. What I've come to realize with most people is it's also permission to ignore. And I can't believe how many people need permission to ignore. I want to, I want people to hear me, right? You have your buy box, 93703, three or four bedrooms, you know, yada, yada, yada. Nothing changed day to day. Congratulations. Turn your phone off. Go do something else. We are only looking at that. I can't tell you how many people go, hey, Michael, I uh, I looked at my buy box today. Nothing changed. So I had 20 minutes. I went and did something else. I'm like, no, stop it. You're getting confused. You're letting new stuff in your head. Ah. I agree. It messes, it messes the focus up. And so I've always been really good at sometimes hyper-focused to a fault. But it, but it really does help me. And so I've mm -hmm. been able to maximize each, just like you and others, each purchase you get better. Each mm -hmm. build I get, I get better at it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm becoming, I don't even want to say an expert, but I'm becoming better at what yeah. I'm doing. And so, let's, so yeah, you I write the that. burr, it, I call it burr 2.0. Yeah, it's really I, what it is. I agree. Build, rent, refi it out in the 30 year and then repeat it. I'm able to build these projects with less than 5%. I was adding it up in. Mm -hmm. So the four properties that I have, it's 10 units, four properties. I built some multifamily and single family. I have a total of $89,000 in it. Four That's properties. Amazing. So let's so let's let's walk through a house just so people can watch the cash flow. And we'll just use round numbers. We don't have to be too exact. So there is a purchase of a lot of somewhere between 10 and 15 grand. I'm going to assume that's cash. Is that fair? Yes. yes. Okay. So you get the lot, you secure it, you own it free and clear. I'm going to guess again that you go to a bank, you post that lot as collateral, and you get a construction loan for the build. Is that a fair yes. guess? That's good. And I'm going to guess the bank will do it in probably five to six draws, right? You build, you post, you get your, is that fair? Five to six? Yes, that's that's it. Okay. And they're probably funding, gosh, 90%, maybe even 100% of construction. How much percent of construction are they funding? So I do make banks compete. Good. And and have good relationships and good credit. Y'all, we talk about this. This is important. It gives options. So I've got a, a new bank that's giving me 85% of appraisal. Well, I already know I can build it for less than 80. Oh, so, okay. So 85% of appraisal. Translate that for folks that don't get it. So that's after after build. So they're looking yes. at the plans. So they're the appraising lot. Okay. Yes, after after the construction, they're saying, okay, it's worth, and I'll just give an example. This is worth two hundred and sixty thousand. Okay. And they're they're loaning, I don't know what that would be, two hundred and twelve, two hundred and fifteen, something like that. Okay. Well, and I can, can build it build it for less. For less. And, and but I'm also I'm managing what my even even when I get to the permanent. Mm -hmm. I want to cash flow well. So I'm not gonna over leverage and create one. You say uh, alligator. I'm saying I want even a little bit extra margin. Yes. I don't even want to get close to the zero. No. I, I want to have, you know, for me, I'm wanting to have ideally $200, $250 of excess cash flow. And a lot of these are more than that. And, and the more I'm doing it, I'm trying to keep it even above 300 yeah. to start. But and also, again, these are new construction. So these are new that, construction. That margin is extra safe because you likely got, gosh, five to ten years before any capital, right, needs to go back in. So it's it's I love that. So I just want to make sure people get the money. So you post ten or fifteen grand for the lot. You go to a bank, use the lot as collateral. They're going to loan. I'm just going to call it all of the construction cost. You build it, you uh, get a certificate of occupancy, you rent it, you have a signed lease. You then go back and put on permanent financing because construction is variable if people don't know. Um, yep. And at that point, you're willing to leave equity in the deal, but you may not have to uh, is what I think you're telling me. You're right. I'll give a, a general example of this last one we just finished two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, just leased it the first First renter saw it, said, I'll take it for two years. 
Nice. She loved the quality of the build, looked at several others. So we built it, and this is 202000 all in, every cost from the purchase of the lot all the way to the financing, even including wow. the closing cost to the financing, 202000 It okay. appraised at two sixty two. Okay. So the 75% loan to value was one ninety six five. Okay. I did that. I in hindsight, so I then only had six thousand total dollars in this project. Yeah. So let me do some math. So in my in my world, I use this thing called yield, right? Yes. Right. So let's let's just do the math together. So all right, let's do the the numerator is expected cash flow. How much cash flow, net expenses, all of that do you expect a month on that house? You think three hundred dollars a month. All right. So three hundred times twelve. <laughs> quick math. The thirty six. Uh, 3,600. And you said how much money was left in the deal? I think it ended up being 6,500. 6,500. So that yield is only 55%. Expected cash flows the numerator, folks, 3,600. The denominator is cash left in the deal, which was 6,500. And it is a 55% yield. I would agree with Brandon. Build, rent, Refi repeat is Burr 2.0. You got to have the skill. You got to have the experience, all of that. Uh, but it can be learned, right? You're right. Wow. Burr 2.0. That's the title of this video. I will say as I'm getting older, the next two builds, which I'm starting you know, here in the next couple of weeks, I'm probably not going to do it that tight. I've got the money. I am probably want a little more cash now, flow. So when you say tight, Tell people what that means. You don't want 300, you want 400, 500. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm about? looking at four to 500 because I'm I'm running it like a business mm -hmm. in that I take the financials off of every single property. I then do what's called common sizing, which is converting the, uh, the top line number. And then I'm breaking out all the expenses and each expense represents a percentage mm -hmm. of the, uh, the, the rents. I'm wanting to get... Oh, here in the next five years, I want to get to over 25% net net income to me nice. so that the things I can control, things I can't taxes, insurance, you know, I've got the allocation for maintenance and I'm growing by the year because mine are brand new. We're starting at 7% and right. I've chosen 1% a year add increase. So then by the eighth year, I'm at 15%. There you go. Makes sense. Yeah. So that's what I'm like doing. It. I found a, a little niche. These properties I'm building, they're about 45 minutes out of Dallas Fort Worth proper. Okay. They're outside of city limits. Mm. Well, guess what? My taxes only represent 9% versus the 15% of inside city limits. Mm. That margin alone on this property is about $2,200, $2,400 extra in my pocket. Yeah, that was That's the big difference in these properties. When I was running those numbers, I was like, that's why this works here, because I'm only paying here in Texas. Property tax is a big number. And mm -hmm. so it's typical is about two point four percent is about that average. These are outside city limits. It was one point two percent. Well, I'm mm -hmm. getting that margin is why I get that extra margin to get to that three hundred. I like it. I like it. So actually, you know, let's just do some, I love math. So let's assume the next properties are going to be 500 a month, which 500 times 12 is six grand. Uh, but obviously you're going to leave more money in the deal. Yes. So let's assume, so if your cash flow is going to go up to 500 instead of six grand, you're probably going to leave like 30 grand in the deal. Does that sound fair? That's, I was running that calculation. I, I was thinking between 30 and 35, it just depends on right. the interest rate when we close. Yeah, let's assume 35 for the worst case scenario. I just want to see I've what happens to the yield. There, so I've already bought yeah. the lot. So that's so, already done. Yeah, so the beauty of all of this is we, we turned a property that was, you know, again, in his words, tight, but had a 55% yield, which is amazing. Now what we're going to do is get more conservative, leave more money in the deal, and the yield collapses, crashes, falls to 17%. That that's is right. still that's exactly right. way above you know, what a great deal is in most of the country. This build 
uh, rent, refi, repeat, Burr 2.0 is amazing. So let's break down for the folks that are looking at this going, hmm, you know, I want to give this a shot. Uh, the beauty of all of this, first and foremost, is people are in school, right, with you. They can tag you. They can ask questions. I know you're great with responding, so thank you for that. So join school, get part of Burr 2.0. But I want to talk about something you said earlier. You said each house is kind of custom. So how I translated that in my head, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe we're just talking finishes. Are we talking about a brand new architecture and design and floor plan every time? I mean, are we going there or what? Um, no, I'm, I'm talking about finishes. Like these next good, two. Good answer. Saving, good answer. <laughs> yes. I'm saving money because it saves cost on uh, architect work and, and building yep. out the plants. So oh, I'm doing yeah. the exact same property. As you I should, know I my think. cost. I just yeah. finished it. It's exact. The next two are going to be the exact same floor plan, exact same, actually exact same finish because these lots are far enough away from this house. Same colors, same tile. I might get bored. That's the only thing I'm worried about is I might get bored. But right. I have another lot, the tax one I just bought. I will, because it's close to some of the others, I'm going to have to change it. I'm already working on, on that. I changed the little Now, when you say... When you, oh, so you're actually changing the floor plan. I was thinking you would just change the exterior, right? But no, you're talking about changing it's, the floor plan? Yeah, it's, it needs to look. It's so close to one of them that I need to do a little bit different look. Okay. Now, why? I'm going to push back. Why? They're just rentals. Why does it have to be different? Is it because you're bored? I'm I'm bored. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's just, I'm I being own, honest. Dude, I own three houses on a street right next to each other that I picked up in the last crash. Um, all I did was paint them different. All I and did that, was paint them different. You might be right on that. I do things. I, a few years ago, I did a, a flip and I told my wife, she says, why are you doing this? I said, I'm just flat bored. I want to try something new. Um, uh, this Okay. Let's just have an honest discussion. <laughs> I have seen getting bored cause people to lose money. Right. You're in the business of making money. I did it because I wanted to learn the process. I oh. didn't lose no, no, I get it. But I just want other people to hear this. Yes. And be careful with that. Oh my gosh. Be careful. Yeah. Because I would challenge you. If you have a house that's close, it, it sounds like not next door, but streets it's away. It's actually cat a corner to it. Okay. So it's like directly across the street. Like, yes. So, I mean, most neighborhoods these days have houses that look the same. I think I'd change the exterior color. for. I'm just nerve. I just want other people to hear how nervous I am. Right. You have a model that works. We're calling it a bird 2.0. We've already talked about a 17 to 55 percent yield. And the and the guy pushing this is bored making money. Oh, what are we doing, Brandon. Come on. I know. I'm sorry, but that, I'm just being honest and genuine. It's, just it's awesome. I'm, and I'm just pushing back because I can. So yeah, cool. yeah. Um. So why don't we because, again, I think one of the processes that I think I think when people hear build, they think construction. And what I would tell people just having gone through a nasty ADU process, there's all kinds of stuff pre-construction. So talk about once you own a lot process, getting to the point of construction, because I don't think people understand timelines, costs, activities for all of that. Paint that picture, Brandon. Yeah. So you, depending on where you're building, you have to get the, uh, the floor plan approved you also have to work on the utilities, getting the water meter there. That's one of the things that takes a little bit of time. Looking at the lots, I try to pick lots that are flat. I know every bit of elevation, and this is things that everybody should know. If it's got more elevation, you better deduct that cost off the purchase because the profit's made in the purchase. Right. And you're so you're looking at that. It does feel real slow, the engineering for the for the slab. Yeah. You want that. You're not doing, you do not compromise that foundation because mine are all slab foundation. I want it, the engineered foundation. I want to make sure it's done right because I yeah. plan to keep these 30 years. Awesome. I don't want to have it done cheap where I'm going to have more maintenance. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. I'm paying for it up front, doing it yeah. right, but it takes that process of even getting to being dried in where it's framed and 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 roofed it it's ex excruciatingly slow but you want it done right 
Yeah. So I just want to give people kind of a timeline. So you close on the dirt and then you start, you know, putting up the frame timeline. What? 90 days is fast. Five I'd months. Say is that. Kind 90 of average. days is it can be as little as 60 if things are lined up well, but six, 90 days. I have a GC that helps me. I okay. handle certain pieces of it. He handles the things I don't like. It's a great arrangement. Uh, I always add for every build I do, I know builders, I'll add two to three months to whatever they say. That's just being okay. true. If you want to manage expectations, if they say six months, plan on eight. Got it. But again, they're kind of getting, I want people who haven't done this. I think, again, a lot of new investors immediately go to the sticks, right? The construction part from lot closing to building, putting out actually the frame again, three months, 60 days is possible, but not for a new investor. Just to be clear. It's going to be 90 days in a, in a, in a state like Texas, 90 days in a state like California, probably six months. And, you know, once you get there, it, 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 it could be nine months is what I want people to hear before you're actually doing something on the lot. Is that reasonable? Yes, that's that's reasonable. That's why I tell everybody, manage your expectations and create the scenario. Okay, I'm going to be in construction if the builder says six months or the builder says a year. If they're saying a year, I'd probably add three to four months. If they're saying six months, I'd probably add two months. This latest build, we had an unfortunate scenario. It was pouring down rain all this spring in Texas. So it slowed it down by at least 60 days. I can't control it. Neither can the builder. It is yeah. what it is. You don't got a big umbrella? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, huge that's, tarp, that's, you know? Yeah, huge tarp. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so again, I think this this is a very interesting strategy. I think it works. It probably works in a lot of the country. Again, I think this is Burr 2.0. It's one not a lot of people talk about build, uh, rent, refi, repeat. You got to watch margin timelines. This is why you're shopping for lots all the time. Because A, a lot commitment is relatively small. It's 10 or 15 grand. It becomes the collateral for the construction loan. And when you, when you buy this tax lot, you know that you're not going to, there won't be a construction person on site for six or nine months. That's why you you're always in lot acquisition mode. Is that fair? Yes, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to get to where I'm s at least a year out. I'm right. missing about three lots right now for next year, but I'm always on the hunt. I'm always looking, staying within the buy box. I know exactly yeah. what I'm looking for, and I do have one multifamily lot that I have kind of banked already for 2026 build. There's a reason why I'm waiting. There is a whole bunch of new multifamily being built in our community. Ah. And I want to see where rents fall before I choose. I want those that new inventory to get absorbed. Yeah. And so I'm really I really am holding it for 26 to make sure I'm not making a mistake on the build and my what I'm going to get in rents. So I am banking that lot right now just because locally there's over a, a thousand new um multifamily apartments being built right now in a town of about 40,000 people. Got it. Got it. Well, let's talk about owning lots. Cause again, owning lots, uh, again, it doesn't produce rent. Typically sometimes people can do parking or things of that nature. Generally speaking, no rent, uh, but you do have some expenses. You obviously have property taxes yearly. You probably have some insurance, although I'm sure it's very minimal, but you also have, at least in California, we have to clear debris, we have to mow the law, you know, mow the weeds or whatever they are. Um, talk about just owning lots for that year and what, maybe what total expenses might look like for, for the year of ownership. Yeah. So here we, we just have to, you pay the property tax and you have to maintain it by mowing it. That yeah. that's the big expense. And that's why I don't want to hold them too long because it's just been an expense. It's a lot, right. it's a lot alligator. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it is. It is yeah, a lot exactly. of alligators. Not that it's not much money, but it, I'm trying to keep them within a year, year and a half. You want to say time frame, yeah. learning those lessons. Okay. I got to get it producing money mm -hmm. fairly quickly. So I'm just trying to keep it in that long, that amount of time so that I'm getting to it, but I also have my next bill. So I'm not sitting and waiting, looking for land. I could wait because it takes, I, I feel like it takes me to find them six months. This I'll give the story of this single family. So I'm at Thanksgiving 
and I'm hearing my my little my nephew and I hear him saying he has a lot for sale. He's in real estate and he has this lot for sale for fifteen thousand dollars. He was talking to somebody else. Yeah. And I, my, yes. I was like, wait a minute, wait. A minute. So then I went over to him and I got him to tell me a little bit about it. And I said, Oh, I'm gonna be over there tomorrow morning. This is Friday morning after Thanksgiving. I'm driving over there looking like at this it. lot. Commitment. Yes. And I ended up, I did not buy that lot. I, could, I actually told him why it will not sell. And I gave him the reasons why you can't build on it. But I found two others in nice. that same area. So I'm always on the hunt and I have to, to stay ahead of it. Exactly. So that I'm ready to be building the next ones. So that that's why I'm always looking to buy, but I'm keeping it managing cash well, I can't buy too many if I bought right I'm going to be really hurting so it's you know one two at a time limiting how much cash is going out managing like cash flow. managing cash yeah. flow. no I mean back to the earlier story about your your parents or your father losing ad business right you got to watch cash flow if you if you go too fast too quick into an environment you, you could choke off cash flow and become a forced seller you don't want to do that I've watched a company at the bank was profitable, went bankrupt because of not managing cash flow. And I'll never forget it. Yeah, people need to hear that. You can be a profitable business and go bankrupt if you don't watch cash. It's timings of revenues and expenses. They've got to be very similar. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Well, hey, I know you had an opportunity or you have, right? Future have an opportunity to speak to high, you know, seniors and also seventh graders about finance and money. I'd be remiss if we don't talk about what that's going to be like. What are you thinking about sharing? I think here's my plan. And um, we're going to play the game of cash flow. I like it. Have them play Huge it. Because the classes are only 45 minutes long. I'm probably going to have them play it two days. Then we're going to have a day of sharing what they're learning. Ooh. Then we're going to okay. play it again one more day. So they've heard what everybody's learning. So that's the day four, because I've only got a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I feel like their their hearts and their minds are open after playing cash flow. The final day, that, that Friday, then I'm going to really share some things on investing and investing in real estate, because I feel like they'll be more open to it because they played a game that teaches that. That is That is my plan. Let me give you one little twist that if I had this opportunity that I would do. And actually, it's funny. I talked about it on the daily financial news this morning. Get half the audience or half the students to be lawyers or doctors and the other half to be janitors. Seed the deck. Be you know, okay. because I think because what will happen is I expect janitors in most cases will get out of the rat race first. And that experience is eye opening. There are so many people that think you got to be a doctor making 200 grand a year to have a shot. That is asinine. I think it's easier to get out of the rat race if you make 60 grand a year than if you make 600 grand a year. And I don't think most people understand that. I agree. So I would, yeah, I would do that. I've struggled with it, being honest. I've yeah. done very well and I've watched lifestyle creep. And, and I'm now playing reverse and trying to reduce that footprint of my expenses so that I can get to financial freedom. I have done that exact thing. I'm trying to learn that lesson quickly. And I, yes, I think that's a great idea because we, we all struggle with lifestyle mm -hmm. creep. It's something we have to fight all the time. Yeah. The other thing that I have told, I've had the opportunity to speak to high school seniors, I don't know, a dozen times or so. And I always ask them, how many of you think you could survive on 3000 bucks a month? And again, they're high school seniors, so they don't know, but all of them raise their hand. And I said, if that's true and you do that for a decade, you could be retired by the time you're 30, financially free. And then that sparks all kinds of conversations because the problem is when you're 20, you're young and dumb. You let lifestyle creep come in. I mean, I'm the moron and idiot who uh, went and got, you know, an advanced degree, student debt, got a $40,000 job and bought a $50,000 car. So that screwed up my life because I was, my debt service was all messed up. So it, it really, we have to get the seniors who are right on the cusp of being given credit cards because they're not yet 18 or if they are, 
you know, maybe they signed already. We got to let them know that that is not a blessing. That's a curse. That's bad debt. Um, so I really want my seniors when I get the chance to talk to them to, to, to realize that if they could, if they can truly live on three grand a month for a decade, I think they're going to be financially free by 30. And if you're financially free by 30, can you imagine how great life will be? I agree. I'm going to talk about good debt and bad debt. Those are part of the conversation at that, that last day. hundred percent. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Well, Brandon, again, I think you've discovered Burr 2.0. I want to thank you again for being a part of school and answering questions, which I'm sure are going to come in hot and heavy after this. Uh, where can people find you? I've just started a YouTube channel. You encouraged me at February. I just started it. So bear with me. Awesome. It's rough. It's Those first ones are rough and I'm learning. So I have Build to Rent Texas is nice. my that I'm just getting started. I've got some filming I just did to make another video at that property. So I'm, I'm learning all of that. I'm not technology savvy. Here, I know. Let me, let me tell you this. I am so happy you have a YouTube channel and you're documenting what you're doing. Let me give you these words of advice. Don't edit your videos. What I want you to do is turn on your cell phone or if you have somebody filming you, when you're on site, find something that you can riff on for three to five minutes. And if you want to get crazy, find two somethings. Like talk about the, I don't know, the 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 new drain line or the new this or the new that or why you chose to put the bathroom over here or over there. Just documenting the experience. Document walking lots, right? Think about this, that property you walked on Friday after Thanksgiving. You told your nephew why it won't sell. Imagine walking the property with your phone and going, hey, this elevation here, it goes the wrong way. The slope's more than four degrees. I don't know what it is. I'm making stuff up. Right. Just bank authenticity. I think the the world of YouTube a year from now will be authentic and not edited. I think the days of Mr. Beast and overproduction are over. People want authentic. So I know a lot of people that come to YouTube that are inspired by what we've done at One Rental at a Time automatically are hiring at video editors and thumbnail creators and all of that. And I think you're going to get a lot farther being authentic and just pointing out things that you that are almost second nature to you, that people will just be so attracted to you. I appreciate the advice. I had thought about documenting these next two builds now that I have them about to start. Do it. So that's, that would be the plan. The raw material that's going to be, we'll talk to the city, show the floor plan. Like you could even, you know, do a video. Well, Hey, look at the, 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 you know, the architecture diagram or the, the layout. This is why we do this. You know, it'll be, it's, you have so much authentic content coming. Don't over, don't overthink it. And I'll be there in February again. I, I'm taking my wife this time nice. and, and I'm bringing two in, new investors that just bought their first duplex. They're coming with us. So oh, we'll, nice. we'll see you there face to face. Awesome. We'll see you in Vegas. Make sure we take a picture together. Um, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Brandon, thank you so much. Thank you.